Detroit University has been working with uh, some students and, and on this single cell project and uh, trying to, again, advance the notebook in terms of scalability and speed. So, take it away, Jason. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, I'm from Drake University and I'm working with two students with this Ira Hansen, who's over here, has done a lot of the back end work with the single cell notebook, and there's Ian Q Wizard now, and, and Alex Kramer, who couldn't be here because apparently when he graduated high school, they wanted him to be on still as the assistant debate coach that he's in Texas right now, is uh, helping the debate team. Um, these are two students that have been working with me. He's been working a lot on the front end. And special thanks to uh, the Utmost Grant, the NSF grant, is funding me to work on this over the summer, and Drake University, which is also paying Ira and Alex to work on this. Uh, the fantastic Sage Days in January and March that you've heard about, uh, where the initial conception of this idea came out, and then some major refinements of the idea, um, particularly to William Stein for helping write some of the initial code and, and saying we should do this. <laughs> the IPython guys for giving some very good input into a protocol and, and how we should communicate back and forth with the front end server. Robert Bradshaw for also in those uh, discussions. If I've missed anybody, raise my hand or raise your hand and say something. Okay, um, I use a little bit of sign language that Rob Beezer wants to introduce me to. If you can't hear me, go like this so I can see it. If you can't see something, this is the sign. If it's over your head, this is the sign, and if I'm going on too long, this is the sign. <laughs> if you get hungry, this is the sign. <laughs> okay, so short demo of uh, what we have so far. Um, you want to print high, and it prints high. So the idea is we have a single stage cell embedded in a web page here. This is uh, going Can you back. Zoom in on that, Jason? the font size. Yeah. Bump up your font size. Increase the font size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Trying to make sure. Okay, there we are. Okay, yeah, so print high and it uh, goes off to Sage and prints high. You can do stuff that involves Sage specific syntax like print three squared. So this is showing you that we're actually doing pre parsing and things like that. The Sage notebook, it's not just straight Python. Evaluate and it appends. This particular web page appends the output, and you get 9L. Um, one of the goals for this uh, single sage cell, single cell sage page, is that we're trying to to make it generic Python as much as possible, so people like from SciPy and WebWork and whatever else can use it without Sage. Uh, but we're also trying to involve Sage where uh, it's useful. So you can click this little checkbox here, and you'll see that. Uh, it's going to complain that, or actually, it's going to do three XOR one, which is what Python does when you do three or three XOR two. Uh, but if you click the Sage mode, then it does the Sage pre-parsing and loads the Sage libraries and all this kind of stuff. Good. So anybody can just try this out right now. If you see the out. URL at the top, just try to go for it. There's a three four five four six boxend.math. That here, let me write it up here. So. People can, if you get bored, you can start, you know, breaking the system. But please don't break it too much because I'm using it live for demos here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you can add it to the. Box and dot math. Dot Washington. Dot edu. Everybody hit it at once. That's right. Well, it should work. I'll give you some timing information in just a second. Five, four, six, seven. So it's four, five, four, six, seven. Okay, so unlike Carl Dieter's experience, this should actually scale here. That's part of the purpose for this. You can actually you can also use sagemath.org colon 5467. So oh, sagemath.org. The DNS is the same. Yeah. Okay, that's easy. Yeah, let me put that up. Another example here, uh, you can create files and automatically pull the files back to you. So here we're going to write hi in a file, and then evaluate. So we write hi, or we write hi into this file, and then we print out done. It gives you the output back, and then it gives you whatever files were created. So this is how the Sage Notebook usually does graphics. Uh, graphics are written to the disk and then automatically scooped up and sent to your browser, and uh, that all works in test.txt. Um, you also are able to upload files 
Uh, except I think there's a bug in this from some changes that we were making on Saturday. So you should be able to upload files and it'll write it to the disk and you'll be able to do these files. So like Rado's uh, image example, you should be able to upload an image file. It'll write it to the disk in the current directory of your code and then you can just play with that file however you, however you would if it was just in the current directory. So you can open the image and do something with it. Okay, um, and let's see, one more demo. Uh, Interax, <laughs> public Interax, woohoo. Um, we are not only writing uh, Interax to be working with this sort of in a public web page without authentication and signing in, but we're also trying to take a real heavy look at the Interact architecture and simplify things and sort of rewrite things now that we have a lot of experience with these things. Um, and so here's an example. So, so what's this going to do? This is going to set up a slider, a checkbox, and a, and a button, a series of buttons, and it's just going to print out the prime pi of 1,000. So if you have the new wiki, I forget what the current question on the wiki is, but this is how to test how many primes are below, I think below or below or equal to. I guess it doesn't matter in this case. Below. Below. Strictly less below. Than. Okay, less than, and yeah. The new question is below. You wrote it too. Below or equal. Oh, okay, so should we make this 10,000? <laughs> okay, so. Definitely is equal. It's definitely equal. Talks with the number theorists in the room about what it should be. Yeah, yeah. T uh, is it's going to be a checkbox anyway. So enough of explaining. Let's just evaluate this thing. And uh, if everything works, it's going to crash. Okay. I can never get the interact to work easily. No, hold on just a second. Okay, hold on. I knew I was running into trouble if I did this type. Live. Okay, let's try this one more time. Ow! Oh, it was just working five seconds ago, or five minutes ago when I was setting up. Okay, we'll come back to this. So the idea is that interacts work. Uh, <laughs> like I said, the idea. And uh, I should say right off the bat, this is a work in progress. I mean, we're, there's a lot of patches that Iris, for, for example, put on our, our GitHub repository that I haven't merged from Saturday and Friday. Uh, it's definitely a work in progress still. You guys crash it. Okay, who tried to crash it? <laughs> okay, we'll we'll come back and maybe I'll do this demo on my on my uh, computer. Okay, so code. It's up on GitHub. Uh, if you go to GitHub and just look for Jason Grout, it's one of my repositories. Simple Python DB compute, a name that harkens back to uh, initial uh, versions that we sort of almost fully rewritten now uh, from January. Uh, how many people are familiar with GitHub? See GitHub. Okay, yeah, so we're using GitHub for our development here. Uh, when we move to Sage, we'll probably switch back to Imperial. Number. But, okay, and code. So this is for Michael Gage here. This is, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, sorry. This is the actual HTML code to include that. So this is the, if, if I do view source code on this page right here, mm -hmm. this is what I get. So there's a bunch of there's a few scripts that we uh, that we're including, uh, jQuery and things like that. Code Mirror, we're using the Code Mirror 2 editor, and uh, here's sort of the, the important thing right here, just the form. Um, make a text area, and then of course Jake <coughs> Code Mirror changes that into a Code Mirror syntax highlighted. Uh, we make some hidden values and a button, and and this is really it. Uh, there's the end of the page right there. So this is the sort of stuff that you would embed into a web page in order to have this work. The cool thing is, is that we're talking to the server using JSON, so you don't even have to have a web page. I mean, the purpose for the web page is to have JavaScript that formats this message to do this computation. But really, you can have any sort of program that is sending messages to the server saying, hey, do this computation. Here's an ID for, for my computation. And, uh, and then you just keep pulling back for output and you get the output. And Display it however you want. Service. So it's just, it's really is a web service. That's right, and that's how we do some of the timing tests. For example, we have Python uh, thing does timing tests and just sends a JSON and gets JSON back. An iPod app would work the same way. Web or web work probably work the same way. It's, it really is a, a web service for doing Sage computation. Sage Tech could use this to do Sage Tech if it wasn't installed on your computer. Okay. So. Uh, Yes. Is there a way to interrupt the computation? Uh, no. I can kill the server pressing Control C, <laughs> but no, there's no way to go back and say stop. You could just refresh the page and let 
Are you the one that crashed the server? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trying to make a matrix space. Oh, so that should work. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, it depends on how big it is, right? Can someone check this hotbox box in there right now? Yeah, it depends on how big it is. That might bog down things. Okay, good for you. Yes, we need people to stress test this. And, uh, and I think we have, we at least started to implement computation limits. And so, I don't know. Sorry. Blame you. We won't blame you anymore. We, I think we implemented computation limits because inadvertent is probably more often, but also malicious use of resources, right? That's a big concern. And so we're trying to make this really secure and really easy to set up, but also have a lot of limitations so that people can't take down your server uh, maliciously or inadvertently. All right. So goals with this. Um, one goal, of course, is to be able to just use Sage without having to log in. Use Sage without having to log in, being able to just put up an example. Another goal, web work is another goal, being able to integrate Sage with other applications. So iPod, web work, Google, you name it. Now we have a RESTful service for doing Sage computations. Um, another goal, and this is sort of the broader goal in the utmost project, is to set up something, uh, some repository of little interacts or repository of little worksheets and things like that. That's sort of a the, well, I'll show you what we're trying to, re to, to replace here. Um, let's see, Sage Interactive. You type that into Google. Top hit is a wiki where we have, here are a bunch of examples of interacts uh, using Sage. And what you do is you just copy all this code. You find what you want, which is usually way out of date. You copy all the code into <coughs> a Sage notebook, and hopefully it works. And, it, and you don't really see sort of dynamically what happens. So you have to log in. and Know, copy it, then execute it, and then you get this nice sage, sage interact. So the idea with the single cell server is it's a component of a web database of interacts and, and other worksheet materials where the user can just immediately start uh, playing around with the interact. So there's some tag searchable. I want all the interacts to deal with calc 3 and you know, motion or something like that, and it pulls up a couple of pages, and you click on one, and hey, there it is. Click a button, and all of a sudden, there's a live interact in your cell start dragging things around and start playing with it. So a web service that uh, interacts, that, that is included in uh, a larger database of interactive materials uh, that we distributed. So you can think of it as, I mean, lots of other systems are set up out there, like MATLAB File Central, uh, the Mathematica Demonstrations Project, uh, MapMaple has one, some applets site. Mathematica also has a file site where there's a bunch of user-contributed files. Um, something like that for Sage. Now, it's not just Sage that's interested in this. Uh, the broader SciPy community has been having conversations about this since last year. So we're trying to work together. In fact, there's a demo written in Django. You mentioned Django. Yeah, there's some people in the SciPy community that are writing sort of a, a code snippet you know, library using Django to uh, have something like this. So lots of documents that show you how to do cool things using SciPy and NumPy. And one idea is to have this sort of thing also there. So not only can you see the document, but you can click a button and it sends it off to a server and does the computation. You can modify it a little bit and send it off again and, and do the computations right there. All right. So uh, that's like the big overview. Um, now we're going to get down into technical details. So I'm going to show you the architecture. And uh, before I show you the architecture, I'll give you a few numbers. Um, these numbers have been running lots and lots and lots of tests and learning a lot about the benchmarking. Uh, let's see. Here. This is what I want. Oh, thought I had it. Oh, that's all up. There's two seconds. And okay, now it should come up. Yes, OK. Um, here's a few numbers. Um, one thing. Okay, those of you that are really <coughs> benchmarking, tell me if these numbers make sense. So when I, I'm, these numbers are doing, you know, using Boxen, 24 processor machine, and the tests are done from Sage.math, so there's sort of no network latency, I don't think, between Sage.math and Boxen. Um, if I start up Nginx, and without starting up UWSGI, so this is just testing web server throughput, 
I get about 8,000 requests per second. So this is um, asking Nginx for a page that doesn't exist, so Nginx sends back a, a, an error page. And 8,000 requests, per, okay, so who in here has any sort of experience benchmarking? Mike, I'm looking at you. Okay, does this sound reasonable? Yeah. Robert Bradshaw said it sounded about reasonable too. Okay, so if I start up, <coughs> If I start up uh, UWSGI and just ping a page, so I have a URL that's this thing slash ping, and it just sends back a short little text something, then I get about 2,000 requests per second. Using, I mean, what, what, what's your server? Okay, the server is uh, like 100 threads of UWSGI on Nginx. Yeah, no, no, I, guess, I guess it goes into WSGI, but then what's handling? Class. Class. Okay. Yeah. So 2,000 requests per second. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Ballpark idea. Okay. Um, so this, I think, says that Flask is doing pretty well scalability wise. Yeah. I mean, I guess in the sort of web framework micro benchmarks, right. it's doing fairly, fairly well. Okay. So when I do computations, um, I'm getting, well, Right now, I'm getting around 200 computations per second. So this is total computations. This involves several requests to the, to the server. One request to send the computation. And it seems like usually there's about two polling requests. So one request asking for output, nothing comes back yet. So it requests again. And these are happening like a third of a second between each other. So there's a, a send computation, a third of a second, ask for output, a third of a second, ask for output. It seems like a lot of times we're starting to get output by, this, by those. So about 200, so this is sort of representing how many users we're getting per second. And last week, there was some things with the benchmarking software that I'm using. Basically, if you try to do multi-threading in Python, well, okay, multi-threading doesn't work in Python because of the global interpreter lock. Multi-processing does do parallel stuff in Python. So there was an issue with that with my benchmarking. And I thought I was getting uh, when I was trying to take care of that, somewhere up around four to five hundred, or maybe six hundred uh, computations per second. So this again represents the actual uh, the load that the server can can handle. Um, so this many users can get their computations done each second. This seems about like what our goals were. Right? So we wanted to to pie in the sky arbitrary goals of something on the order of several hundred at least users being able to use this per second. Um, as, a, as comparison, I think sageandb.org right now can handle about 50 users, 50 simultaneous, 40, <laughs> 40 yeah. to 50. I think the highest I've ever seen is 50, and that's probably right before it like, died or something. Yeah. So but I'm 40. sure that one single clever user could make it so that you can only handle one. <laughs> oh, okay. I just say these computations are just A plus B, just the yeah. sum of two numbers. Yeah, yeah. So it's just really trying to test the, the system of the framework. Sageandb.org right now is just absolutely, totally single threaded. And so if there's anything like maybe you know, creating a worksheet or downloading a worksheet that might lock the rest of the server, then right. it slows to a halt. So maybe one person repeatedly downloading a worksheet could cause a lot of trouble. So having okay. multiple processes or multiple threads is really a good win. Well, does uh, editing a copy do the same kind of uh, nasty? Probably. Mm -hmm. That makes Because I edit a copy, I think it, I have to look, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so when, when you're saying 40, 50, or Sage and B, that's not 40, 50, it is recognized. No, I'm talking Sage and B.org. 40 to 50 users is the max we've been able to see. 40 to 50 yeah. simultaneous active worksheets. But, uh, if you do this automated test, it's probably much less. <coughs> probably. It would probably quickly overwhelm stage of game. Okay, so our goal is to be able to support, you know, on the order of 500 or so users per second. So, okay, so let's. Uh, dive a little bit more into the details. And, and as I give you sort of an overview of the architecture, if you have any ideas for making this faster, let me know, or cutting out things that don't need to be there. Um, okay, so this uses a, a protocol to send messages to the server and to get messages back. And we can see here, uh, 
So let me draw for a short diagram. We have a bunch of clients here. So these are users. Okay? And they're making requests. So they're sending computation requests and getting output back of a bunch of Flask instances. So there's a bunch of interplay back and forth here. Flask is talking to MongoDB in our, set, in our setup here. So there's a big MongoDB database. And this is storing all state of everything. So MongoDB is storing the computation requests. Somebody wants you to print pi. And also storing all output of the computation requests. MongoDB, uh, and so on the other side of MongoDB, on the computation side, we're starting up a number of uh, what we call trusted devices. So these are starting up. These are starting up uh, on the trusted server, or on some trusted server. So, so the user code's not being executed with these guys. This one might be starting up with Boxed, one might be starting up on Sage.math, etc. And each of these guys is is. Uh, talking back and forth with MongoDB, updating state and the database, you know, taking an execution request, and then getting output from that request and throwing it back into the database. Each of these guys is SSHing into an untrusted account. So each of these guys has, uh, let's see, one untrusted, And these things are querying the database through here. So every tenth of a second or so, these guys are saying, OK, give me any computations that haven't been done yet, haven't been sort of started yet, getting the results of a computation. And then they have a bunch of stage workers. So the basic flow is we say print high. sends it into the flask, which says, okay, submit this execution request, okay? So it gets sent into the Mongo database. If we have a file that we're uploading, it also gets sent here and gets sent into the Mongo database. So all the files are being stored here in the database. Um, and it just sits there, okay? So totally separate from that, we have these trusted devices that we've launched. and. These guys immediately start up an SSH session. So this, this communication is SSH and zero MQ. So it starts up an SSH session over here and then establishes some zero MQ links in between the untrusted device and the trusted devices. These guys uh, start pulling the database over the zero MQ link saying, give, a, give me any execution requests that haven't been satisfied yet, haven't been started yet. So they get. Oh, somebody wants to print high. Cool. So these guys, uh, let's see. I'm going to start writing up here. Can we turn off the uh, projector? Which button is turn off the projector? All of these just control the light. Oh, I see. Right there. OK. So these guys right here say get the print high message. First thing they're going to do is queue it up into a, a pool. So we use multi-processing pool in order to, to manage a bunch of Sage workers here. They queue up the request into our pool. And when one of these guys becomes free, they pull that request off. And so now they know that someone wants to print. Right, so we want to exec this request. Uh, there's a little bit more that goes on here. Uh, this guy creates a temporary directory, so, so it knows what files were generated, etc. cetera. Um, then it uploads any files, if there were files that were sent along with the computation, creates a temporary directory, puts files in that directory. Then it sets up a redirect uh, for any output of this computation. Uh, the thing is, is we want messages, instead of just straight text, we're encoding all of our text and all of our communication using JSON. So it sets up a a redirection for any output of this computation, 
to be formatted into a message to be sent back. And uh, and then it pre-parses if it needs to, if you click the Sage Mode button, and then it executes the request. So it executes the print high button, or the print high. Um, after it executes the print high, if there was an interact, it checks, it's injecting some things into the namespace of this execution, and uh, it checks to see if an interact was done. If there's an interact done, then it knows that there's probably going to be some more requests coming across the wire, so it hangs around. If it's not an interact, if there wasn't any interact on this execution, then it just basically terminates and says, okay, you've got your output. Okay, when high is printed out, it's uh, queued up, uh, the output is captured and queued up and sent back to this guy right here. So this is the stream high. But really, is it like a JSON message that... So really, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm hiding some of the details here. Really what happens is it's sent uh, as a message to this queue object that, you know, pi was printed on standard out. And then this formats a message that says, okay, on standard out, there was a high. So it's a, lot, it's a little more complicated than that. And we can look at the actual message in just a second. Um, but yeah, this queue object is reformatting things as messages. And then every one of these workers is sending these messages back to this untrusted device. So this untrusted device is pulling for new computations. So it's, it's sleeping for a tenth of a second, then it pulls for new computations, and then it goes through its queue of all the messages from the workers and sends all of these messages back into the database. So this is where this guy says, uh, check for new computations, no new computations yet. OK, now check for any output of all these guys. And uh, I see I have a message here. And so I send that message back over 0MQ and into the database as an output message of that particular computation. What, what, what role does this trusted device play between that and the same workers? I mean, why okay. not just have the untrusted device be a same worker? That's, that's a, OK, so, so are you asking about this guy or this guy? That guy. This guy. This guy is getting new computations and launching new Sage workers as well as acting a funnel for output. So the reason why we're putting this guy as a funnel for output is to try to batch our output so that there's one sort of big communication across of all the messages of the workers instead of lots of smaller communications. And that's maybe a detail that could be changed. Maybe this guy could send things straight into that's, that over here. So uh, you're envisioning those, the, the trusted worker and being on a separate machine from that SSH thing. That's Are right. the Sage workers just the processes on the, the machine that the the, the uh, uh, trusted device is? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is all of this is totally untrusted in a in a virtual box instance or an extremely restricted user account. The idea is this is what's executing the user code, and you don't want this guy talking directly to your database. You want to sanitize any messages that happen from here to here, and we do that through this guy right here. So he's getting messages in. And then you can sanitize it to make sure you're not like deleting the entire database or something like that before doing something with the database. Okay. Yeah, and so one possibility, the idea, I'm coming from a SQL background, which is where most of my experience is, is you want to batch up things, right? Instead of submitting a thousand messages into the database one at a time, you want to take all thousand messages and submit them all as a batch, you know, insert. And, uh, and maybe with MongoDB, okay, so William here, read. What do you think? Well, I'm clear. So is for it, inserts, it's definitely massively better for updates. Uh, this is an insert. So every message yeah. is being inserted as a separate entity. Uh, then it's in an definitely vastly. It's just like with SQL. Okay. So we should batch things up. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. And the idea also is that zero and two can maybe do some batching as well. All right. So this guy gets sent back in. So now the database has an execution request. So exec. exec uh, print i, and there's some ID associated with this execution request, and it also has on another table now a message, uh, which is a JSON message that says, okay, standard out says i. And we know that these two are tied together through a, a, an execute ID. And then in the meantime, while all this is happening over here on the server side, our user is sitting over here, and his JavaScript is pulling Flask, which then asks the database, for any output on this particular computation. 
And so it's pulling, pulling, and eventually, you know, this guy gets started up and does the computation and comes back and the, the result is put in the database. And then the next poll, uh, this guy says, oh, I've got a new message for you. And this could be a standard out message. It could be a create interact message. It could be create a HTML table message. It could be a, hey, they want you to, you know, here's a Python error that happened in the computation. So there's lots of different messages that can come back. Um, but he gets a message back, and then the client is in charge of formatting this and displaying it for the user. Let's see, did I cover all the details that I wanted to cover? Oh, so this guy printed high in this case, but in the, some other cases, like you saw there, sometimes he'll create a file. So this guy, uh, for any execution request, is also in charge of, after the exec is done, to go through the directory, find any modified files, upload those, so this guy actually talks directly to the uh, trusted device to upload a file to the database, and then also send a message saying, hey, these files were created. This guy gets the message from the database saying, oh, some files were created, and then there's another URL to pull the files out of the database. So you can also handle files being created by the Sage workers. Um, in the case of interacts, we want to stick around, right? Um, we've done some things in this session, there's some state in this session, some objects we've created, et cetera, and when you drag a slider, you want to be able to access the stuff that you created the first time you ran something in that session. So in the case of interacts, this session stays around and listens for more input. You drag it, okay, so everything comes back here, and then there's a slider here that represents an interact. The guy moves the slider, and the computation request is sent back through the system, uh, tagged with the same sort of computation ID, and so the these guys know to route it to the right Sage worker that's still waiting for requests. By default, we wait for 60 seconds for any extra requests on the interact. Does the computation and sends the result back. So one way I think about this is one huge buffered pipeline between the client, the user, web browser, or, or iPod app, or whatever, and the Sage workers. And this is just one big, huge, fancy way of like buffering your output. Uh, setting up one sort of channel between the Sage workers and the client where everything is buffered through MongoDB. So the nice thing about buffering it here is that really Flask doesn't have to just be running on one computer. Flask could be running on two different computers and you send your execute request in here and the way the load balancing works, when you're pulling for output, you actually are pulling from a Flask instance down here and the idea is everything's in the database. All these guys are talking to the database. It's sort of the single synchronization point. And so uh, it's scalable, right? You can start up lots of different class instances and load balance across different computers and be able to handle a lot of requests on this end. And also on this end as well, you can set these things to SSH up into lots of different uh, untrusted accounts on different computers. And uh, everything's sort of managed and, and preserved here in the database. So being really scalable depends on your database. That's being right. Really scalable across That's right. multiple servers. You've got to have. It seems like you've got to have one single point, right, to synchronize everything. And like, who better to synchronize and sort of depend on being scalable than databases? They've been doing it for 30, 40 years, and I mean, their bread and butter is being scalable for lots of people interacting and getting it out there. Are those SSH connections kept held open? Uh, the SSH connection is held open because so we SSH in and start up this device and just hold the SSH connection open. But all the communication actually happens through a zero MQ connection that's set up right after we start the SSH connection. Actually, there's oh, so so there's a patch that Ira wrote that I haven't incorporated yet. There's actually some sort of authentication going on here. So every zero MQ message that gets sent gets authenticated. We calculate an HMAC digest. So we share a secret and then calculate the digest of the message. So we sign the messages as we come back. And we check the signature just to make sure that somebody else doesn't say, or even these guys say, oh, hey, I can connect to this ZMQ port as well and send it to send a different ZMQ message. So there's, there's another detail of what's happening. Um, so do you change that then why you need the SSH connection? To start up things. I need to SSH into a shell and start up this untrusted device worker. Okay. Does that make sense? So, so what I type in the command line is start up my device over here, and then automatically through configuration I say, okay, here's where the where's the 
untrusted SSH account is, and the SSH is in to the untrusted account and starts it up. Do you think it would make much of a performance difference if you said it was all a trusted domain? Um, you had a trusted cluster behind it that was not externally accessible? So, so in other words, not having to do SSH and not yeah. having to do zero. Well, say you could just start up and have some mechanism that had watchdogs and persistent the service on the currently early with these untrusted devices. So I think and they just know where this is zero MQ where they should be sending. Yeah, so I think this is not a, a big problem. This is only this only happens when you very first start up the server. Yeah. And so, so the SSH connection really sort of drops out of the picture after the initial start my device. Right. Zero MQ is what's being used all the time. And right now on Boxin, what happens is it sets up a zero MQ channel on the current on, on the same server. Um, and it's easy to say use a use. I mean, you can tell it to SSH into whatever account you want. Right now we have it into a restricted account, but you can uh, SSH into your own local account. But we. I think we want. I think we want a separation here for security reasons. Um, and if there has to be a separation here, I don't think it makes any difference if this is trusted or untrusted, speed-wise anyway. Is it mainly untrusted because arbitrary codes being run on it? Yep. Yep. So you do want it untrusted unless you, you totally trust your users, right? <laughs> to never make stupid mistakes. Again. That's right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah. these guys have, you know, well, so here. Before we exec the code, we have some computation means you limit the set power process and things like that. Um, so there are some restrictions for like inadvertent things or even malicious things. But yeah, you don't want it to be able to like look at everything on your computer and stuff like that. So you could set up a bunch of virtual box instances if you're really paranoid, right? And presuming it's hard to break out of a virtual box instance, I would just SSH into these untrusted devices here. Just sort of how you're thinking about this going into the notebook as it stands, uh -huh. would this essentially end up each um, executable cell in the notebook would be a separate instance then? No. So so each of these represents a session. And okay. so this would handle each worksheet. So this is a worksheet, okay. this is a worksheet, this is a worksheet. The thing is if I type A equals one in one cell and I try to use A in the next cell, I want yeah, it to be the same. So I that. need to have it in the same session here. So actually, just dovetailing this question, to what extent is this the actual architecture of the demo you just showed us this versus is the planned architecture of what we sort of planned a while ago? Because um, it looks exactly like the one we planned. For it the looks whole very thing. similar. What's the uh, difference? One of the big differences, we're using IPython messaging protocol instead of trying to invent oh, cool. our own protocol. And I think that's a big win for us because as soon as IPython 0.11 comes out, uh, real soon now, a couple months ago, but they're still working on it, right? They're almost there. Um, IPython kernels uh, automatically natively speak this protocol. So right now what we have is an old IPython that we're layering this thing on that takes output and formats the IPython messages. The new IPython will be able to automatically speak this protocol and use zero MQ. So we can cut out some of the, the intermediary steps here when we run the new IPython. Um, and and sort of everything doesn't have to change it at all because we're we're already using the protocol that IPython is going to be using. Is that protocol documented on the web? Or? It is documented, but it's also in flux <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but so, the, I mean, this is mainly the kind of planned thing. So you have a yeah, this thing is labeled the, users, whereas in the demo you showed us there are no users really. Yeah. So well, everyone here is a user, I think, at that point. But they they're I mean, how are they represent? I mean, you don't have things like worksheets and users in the demo that shows. Oh, oh, just how okay. So, so when we're talking about migrating this to like the full stage notebook, yeah, how do you handle users and stuff? Okay, so so maybe this would be uh, worksheets. Right that can be handled separately. So okay, each. Weather. So when you when you open up a worksheet, mm -hmm. think of it as uh, a single cell. So one thing I, I should show you on this is we can actually have multiple requests being done. Yeah, so uh, let's see. Fine. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, another demo here. So this demo,
Okay, so what I'm going to show you is that you can actually sort of execute multiple cells from a single web page here. And it'll send a separate session request to keep track of all the output and things like that. So here I'm going to, so what I'm doing here is I'm basically printing out one to five, but I'm sleeping in the middle. So you'll see streaming output coming back. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to press evaluate twice. So it's going to send two sessions. Okay, two sessions are being done. And uh, did we decide this thing crashed? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. It'd be fun to watch how you fix it. Uh, okay, so here's the error right here. Uh, control C, start device. <laughs> okay, let's see if that works now. Ah. Okay, hold on. This is very educational. Okay, okay let's, let's start everything again. Oh, let me hear the thing. Yeah, hold on. Let me uh, go to that. Okay, so I've stopped the device. Let's see, no other device is running. And then I stopped the web server. MongoDB looks like it's fine too. So I'm going to start the device again. So this is, we can see the command line arguments here. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, let's see, there it is. So uh, I'm starting up this file. This is a trusted uh, device. And I'm telling it that the untrusted account is this. So in other words, there's passwordless SSH built into my account here so that I can SSH in without a password into this account. This is this thing right here. And I say, you start up 50 stage processes. So that's 50 of these things. And uh, the untrusted Python, oh, when you start up those 50 processes, use, use this Python right here. Um, and it does some communication back and forth about what process group ID and everything so that it can safely kill all the processes if it needs to. And then here, I'm going to start up the web server. And this starts up 100 UWSGI uh, processes uh, parsing the flask. Okay, let's see if that fixed everything here. Aha, look at that. Okay, so uh, let me refresh. Okay, so I'm going to evaluate twice. And. Uh, oh, I didn't have any code. Yeah, so it worked, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's evaluate again. So what you should be seeing is something, ah, something dying again. Ten is not JSON serializable. Okay, something. Uh, I'm gonna try one thing, and then we'll fix that bug later. But okay, I'm gonna refresh again. And I'm gonna click pop the JSON node. Okay, not even twice. Okay, so what should happen <laughs> is, uh, let's see, is it the same here? Oh, no, wait, we probably need to restart this guy up again. So one nice thing about this design is if you have any errors, okay, uh, what did happen? Uh, I refreshed, that's what happened. Evaluate twice, okay, here we are. Okay, so two different sessions are being done with two different workers. The front end sort of is just keeping track of what session output is, is tied to what session. Um, one of the nice things about this is, suppose one of these guys dies, right? Now it's dead, it's not taking any more input requests, but everything's being buffered into MongoDB here. So all you do is do what I did and you kill this guy, start up a new one, and, uh, and then it'll start just taking requests that were already buffered here uh, and start giving output back. So the idea is we're trying to uh, not only scale performance-wise, but also if one of these guys goes down, all the states preserved in the database and the computations can sort of just be picked right up again. Um, let, me see if the, let me see if I can get an interact to work here. Uh, from interact, single cell, import star, and interact, then uh, i equals 0 to 100. I, okay, so here's our interactive group. Um, and this is actually working like a, a worksheet session would work. There's multiple computations going on here. So every time I drag a slider, a new computation request is sent. So it's sort of like a cell being executed. And new output is getting received and replacing the old output, uh, the old number that we have here.
here, and we have a timeout of about 60 seconds. So if it doesn't receive a confirmation request in 60 seconds, you'll see the session says, oh, you're done. I'm not accepting any more input on this particular session. And you can see the actual, these are the actual messages that are being sent back. Uh, and so for example, when I drag the slider, this message is sent uh, to the server. Yep. So here's a message being sent to the server. Uh, and here's where I, the slider value here. And then coming back from the server, same session ID, uh, here I said uh, it's an output stream and uh, standard out and you know this is the output of your computation and then it has a special session done you know, the execution was done and, and everything was okay like there weren't any errors being made. so we see some of this protocol happening right here. Jason, are those interacts are they any more responsive than when we see in the old notebook? So we, refreshing and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we can set the, we can set the polling timeouts to do whatever. So that's one of the things is we have a polling timeout asking for output, and we also have a polling timeout on this side uh, for getting output and shoveling it into the database. So you can set the timeouts to be whatever. I think they're sort of on par, but they're but you can do okay. So check this out. What if I want two interacts? This is something you cannot do in the stage notebook. Yeah. Okay, but each interact is. I mean, just fine. You can't do two interacts in one cell in the stage notebook, but aha, look at this. 39, 54, etc. Yeah, so each everything sort of works. Um, the goal is to have interacts inside of interacts work as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, or depending on variables from other interacts. That's right. I don't think we've ever tested it here. <laughs> Let's see. J in range, it'll work. I mean, yeah, I guess, but now change that to J. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. But you need to do dict of the of the Let's list. And now, I think we need to do dict of that list to make it into a dictionary. Sure. Yep. And then do star star arcs. Right here. Yep. That should work. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure to work? Because remember, at interact is parsing this function here. Yeah, I don't think it is that it's star star arc, does it? I'm not. I'm not sure if this. I, I'm thinking Ooh. we might have to do an eval around all this. But 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 hey, that's the reason we have a single cell, right? <laughs> no, you're right. It might not work. Yeah. Okay. 